Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by mailing a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, that's P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And thank you to John and Iona, who also sent along a lovely card, and also to Carl and Carolyn, uh, all uh, supporting the program that way. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Thank you to Larry for becoming our latest Patreon supporter at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. And thank you to Jonathan for increasing his support from the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month, the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support. Now it's time for an episode of Dangerous Assignment. The original air date, May 11th, 1951, and the title is Epidemic, Needle in a Haystack. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to have me looking for the proverbial needle in the haystack. The only difference is the needle I'm looking for means death to about 3,000 people. Morning, Commissioner. Bill said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve, and I'm afraid it's a pretty rough one. You know, sometime you'll give me an easy one and I'll fall flat on my face. Okay, what's the deal? You just named it. What do you mean? That part about falling flat on your face. Oh, fine. Look, you'd better start on page one. Okay. Steve, what would you do if you were a doctor and had a patient with fever, partial deafness, and paralysis? I'd send for another doctor. Steve, answer the question. Oh, okay, okay. So if I were a doctor and had a patient that come down with symptoms like that, I'd try to find out what was the matter with him in a hurry. Suppose you couldn't find out. Couldn't find... Now, look. And suppose, furthermore, that most of the other people in town came down with the same symptoms. Now, just a minute. Would you mind telling me the point of this charming little analogy? There's no analogy, Steve. It's exactly what's going on right now in the little town of Landsberg in our occupation zone of Germany. What? That's right. Within the past three weeks, almost one half the town's population has been stricken. Brother, they must be having a pretty rough time. Look... I'm sorry to hear it, but I don't see what it's got to do with me. I'm a government agent, not a doctor. That's exactly why I'm sending you. But, hey, wait a minute. You said they haven't been able to diagnose the thing so far? That's right. Oh. Are you trying to tell me that this isn't an ordinary epidemic? Could it be a planned thing or something? Somebody conducting themselves a friendly little experiment? At this point, I don't think anything, Steve. And all I'm trying to tell you is that you'd better get over there in one big hurry. Find out what's causing it. And if anybody is responsible for it... Stop him before it's... it's uh, uh, just stop him. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment, a real sweetheart. Fly over to the little town of Landsberg in our zone of Germany and stick my nose into an epidemic. Try to find out if somebody's causing it, and if so, grab him and incidentally try to stay healthy myself. It's Wednesday when I arrive in Landsberg, and it's like a ghost town. 
The streets are deserted and all the doors and windows are shut tight. And then I spot a bunch of people milling around a building which looks like the town hall. In the center of the crowd stands an official-looking fat little gent with a handlebar mustache who's trying to quiet them down. We are doing everything that we can. You are not. Please go back to your home. And catch epidemic. You can do nothing here. Excuse me, are you the mayor? Yeah, Herr Gerhardt. And who are you? Steve Mitchell from the United States. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've been anxiously waiting for you. Come inside, please. Lead the way. I see you later. Don't Oh, what a relief to get away from those people if only for a few minutes. They seem pretty panicky. They are. And I cannot blame them. This mysterious sickness, it's enough to make the bravest among us panicky. Come. Well, there are some people here in my office that I would like for you to meet. Okay. Fräulein, gentlemen, this is Herr Steve Mitchell. Oh, Herr Mitchell. Herr Mitchell, I will start at the center of the table. This is Fräulein Elsa Tanner, a scientist who was vacationing near here and kindly volunteered her services in this emergency. Fräulein Tanner? I'm very happy to make your acquaintance, Herr Mitchell. Next, uh, Colonel Matson of the United States Army Medical Corps. Colonel Matson, Glad you're here, Mitchell. And this is Herr Fisher, a local village doctor. Dr. Fisher? Yeah, I too am relieved to see you here, Herr Mitchell. I certainly hope you will be able to help us to get to the bottom of this terrible catastrophe. I hope so too, doctor. And finally, this is Herr Straubinger, a chief of police. Herr Straubinger? Herr Mitchell? Well, now that I've met all of you, I think somebody better bring me up to date on the situation. Oh, of course. Uh, Colonel Matson. Perhaps you will do it. Sure, Mayor Gerhardt. Thank you. As far as the disease itself is concerned, Mitchell, it appears to be a virus somewhat similar to the influenza type, except considerably more virulent. I see. I suppose it's highly contagious. It certainly seems to be. Any idea how it's transmitted or how it started? Yeah, you've got us. We've checked the water supply, inspected just about all the food in town, checked the air, everything. All we know, Herr Mitchell, is that ten days ago, seven people were suddenly stricken. Seven people, eh? Yeah. All at the same time, Dr. Fisher? Well, within a few hours of each other, Mitchell. Were those people all in the same place at the time, Mayor Gerhardt? No, that is the mystifying part. They were not. They were indeed scattered all over town. Three workers at the woolen mill, a shopkeeper and his wife, a schoolteacher, and my secretary. Mm -hmm. As you see, that makes it a lot tougher, Mitchell. If they had been all together in one place, it might have been fairly simple to isolate the source of contamination. But as it is... It's... Yeah, these seven people, did they all recover? All but one, a worker in the woolen mill. He is still in a very critical condition in the hospital. The epidemic seemed to be over as the first group recovered, and then suddenly it hit again, much harder. And started spreading rapidly. Well, I guess that brings you up to date, Mitchell. Thanks, Colonel. Fräulein Tanner. Yeah? Did I understand Mayor Gerhardt to say that you're a scientist? Yeah, an industrial chemist. I was vacationing at a resort but a few kilometers from here when the trouble started. I felt I should offer my services, such as they are. Have you any theories as to how this disease could be transmitted? No. I have been unable to think of any possibility that has not already been investigated by Colonel Matson and Herr Dr. Fisher. I see. Well, I think I'd like to take a look around the town. Certainly. Here, I'd be very glad to act as your guide. Thanks, Mayor Gerhardt, but I think I can find my way around okay. I will be glad to place any of my police officers at your disposal, Herr Mitchell. Thanks, Chief. I'll let you know if I need any. Don't uh, Looks like the townspeople are still outside the building here. Uh, make way. Get back. Move along. Help me, help me. I beg of you. My husband, he is very ill. Please, Frau Huntsman, let go of me. We are doing everything that we can. My husband, Fritz, I'm afraid he is dying. I tell you, you must do something. But we are doing everything that we can. Oh. Frau Huntsman, stand back, please. Oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Oh, brother, must be pretty rough. Yeah, and the worst of it is they seem to look to me to deliver them. Oh, if only I could. Well, maybe. What's the matter, Mitchell? You smell anything, Colonel? Well, yeah. Uh, smoke? Yeah. Well, that's strange. Issued an order forbidding any fires or burning of trash during this emergency. Anybody see where it's coming from? I see no signs of a fire anywhere. Neither do I, Fraulein Tanner, but maybe we're not supposed to see it. What do you mean? Herr Mitchell, you are not trying to say that such an unimportant thing as the smell of smoke has anything to do with this. Colonel Matson, as a medical man, would you say it's possible that this mysterious disease could be transmitted by means of air currents? You mean smoke? I mean smoke. Mm, yes, I suppose it would be possible. Well, what do you think, Dr. Fisher? I? Why, uh, 
Why, it seems like quite a fantastic idea, but... Yeah, yeah, I suppose it is within the realm of possibility. Okay, let's spread out and find out where that smoke's coming from. We split up into two parties, Mayor Gerhardt, Fraulein Tanner, and myself in one, and the rest of them in the other. The three of us work our way out towards the edge of town, but we don't spot a thing. It's most perplexing, Herr Mitchell. I still smell the smoke, but I don't see the fire. I, for one, am becoming quite tired of this tramping around. I suggest that we all go back to the... Hold it. Hmm? Hey, what's that big building over there? Oh, that's the woolen mill, Mitchell. Yeah. Looks like a thin wisp of smoke coming from behind the building, doesn't it? Come on. But I don't understand. The mill has been shut down for several days due to the epidemic. That's interesting. Steve, I am sorry, but I must say your ideas about the significance of the smoke sound a little fantastic to me. Sure, I agree with you, Elsa. But when you come right down to it, the whole deal sounds fantastic. Now, Gerhardt, you happen to know anything about prevailing winds in this area? Prevailing winds? I don't follow you. Does the wind usually blow from the mill towards the town or vice versa? Mm, let me see. Why, yeah, it does, from the mill to the town. I see. Well, we'll get around the corner here. We'll be able to... Hi, Mitchell, look, an old man over there at the incinerator. Yeah. You, stay where you are. <laughs> Who are you? What are you doing here? And they, uh, you startled me. Answer my question. Why, I am the janitor here at the mill. I was nearly burning some trash. Didn't you know there was an order forbidding the burning of trash? Why, no. Do not lie. But I am telling you the truth. You see, my wife has been sick. I have been home several days taking care of her. Just what are you burning? Some scraps of cloth. Where did you get them? Out of the laboratory. Franz gave them to me and told me to burn them right away. But I cannot seem to get them to burn. They only smoke and smolder. Who's this, Franz? He works in the laboratory upstairs. Please, I have done nothing wrong. Throw what on him at once? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mitchell. Yeah, a guy working in the lab upstairs when the mill's been closed down for a week. Come on, let's just see what kind of work he's doing. Ah. There's the laboratory at the end of the hall. And Mitchell, perhaps at last we're on the trail of an explanation for this hall. Maybe. You will pardon me if I have my doubts, Steve. As I say, this entire affair seems to live. Yeah, yeah, I know, Elsa. Fantastic. Well, here we are. Locked. Perhaps this Franz has gone. Hold it. Yeah, he's inside, all right. I just heard what sounded like a drawer closing. Franz, open up. Come on, we know you're in there. Franz, open that door immediately. What, what, what is the matter? But... That's what we'd like to know, Buster. <laughs> Why'd you have the door locked just now? Well, what business is this of yours? It could be plenty. Answer the question. In my orders, what is the meaning of it? You gave that old giant a certain scraps of cloth with instructions to burn them when there's an order forbidding all fires. But that's a lie. You didn't give him the scraps of cloth? Yeah, yeah, I gave them to him, but I did not tell him to burn them, only to take them away. Why would I want them burned? That's a good question, and here's another. What are you doing here in the lab when the mill's closed down? I do not have to answer that. Look, Buster, in case you haven't heard, there's a little epidemic going on. We have a hunch somebody's doing their best to spread it. How, we don't know. That's just what we're trying to find out. It so happens that three of the first six people to get sick worked here at the mill. Are you insane? Do you actually think I have anything to do with it? I'll know better when you tell me what you're doing here. Very well. I was experimenting with some new dyes for woolen materials. I did order the janitor to burn those scraps of cloth. They had been dyed with my new dye. After all, why should I give to the company the results of my long hours of work on my own time? I heard you putting something in a drawer when we knocked on the door. Was that this dye you were talking about? Yeah. Let's yeah. see it. Very well. Here... It seems as big. Sort of a strong smell. Yeah, yeah. I must somehow remove that if I wish to mark it. And this is just a harmless dye, huh? But of course. Boy, he's lying. Hey, Mayor, you have no right to talk like that. It's obvious, Herr Mitchell. He burns the fragments of cloth which have been soaked in this liquid. The air currents carry the smoke over the village. The air becomes contaminated. That's exactly But you're how... talking nonsense. This dye is harmless. Steve, we can easily find out whether or not this France is telling us the truth. How, Elsa? Well, I am an industrial chemist. I can analyze this dye for you. 
Okay, go ahead, Elsa. And you, Franz, you stay right here until she's through. Elsa goes to work and we wait. The minutes drag by and she makes her test slowly and methodically. And finally, an hour later, she turns to me. I finished, Steve. Yeah? This dye is completely harmless. You sure about that? Yeah, quite sure. I would stake my reputation on it. Have you ever wanted a house in the country? Just a nice little place with birds and trees and things? Well, so did the Blandings. They got theirs, too. But have you heard what's happened to them? If you tune in Sunday, you will, when Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Another Sunday feature will be the Theater Guild on the air presentation of Craig's Wife with Rosalind Russell and Melvin Douglas. We'll be expecting you right here on this station. Now, back to Dangerous Assignment and Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Just when I figure I'm getting somewhere on this deal, I run right into the proverbial stone wall. Elsa tells me the dye is harmless, so my one lead, like the scraps of cloth, goes up in smoke. But along about then, a little idea starts pecking away at my brain. I decide to try it out on the chief of police, Herr Straubinger. So, Fräulein Elsa Tanner analyzed the dye and found it harmless, huh? That's right, Straubinger. And now I'm beginning to wonder just a little bit about it, Fräulein Elsa Tanner. You have something to back up your suspicions? Nothing very concrete, but don't you think it's a little convenient for her to appear on the scene the way she did? I have been wondering about that. Her story that she was vacationing near here and came to offer her services. I think I'd better check up on it. Yeah, and another thing. She seemed very skeptical of the smoke proposition right from the start. And then when we grabbed the dye, she offered to analyze it real fast. Yeah. Well, I will send this sample of the dye you brought me to Berlin to be analyzed. We will see how their analysis compares with Fräulein Tanner's. Then, excuse. Yeah. Straubinger. Yeah. What is that? When? Very well. Something the matter? Yeah, come. There's been an accident at the hospital. Look at the crowd in front of the hospital. Your men have the sidewalk roped off. Yeah, see, there's Sir Dr. Fisher. He's beckoning to us. Right over here, gentlemen. Here, here on the sidewalk. A body? Yeah, here. I will pull back the corner of the blanket. A woman. Yeah. You know, her face looks familiar. Where could I have seen her before? What happened, Fisher? Uh, well, as nearly as we can reconstruct, Schlaubinger... This woman was attempting to make her way secretly into the hospital by means of the fire escape. You mean she fell from that ledge up there? Yeah. Yeah, but here is a strange thing. We examined the contents of her purse to identify her. One of the papers was slightly damp, and there was a broken hypodermic syringe in her purse. A hypodermic syringe? Yeah. Why she was carrying it, we do not know. Has she been identified? Yeah. She is Frau Martha Hunsmann. Her husband worked at the woolen mill. He was one of the first to get sick and has been critically ill here in the hospital ever since. Wait a minute. What is the matter? Yeah, I remember now. I rem remember what? Where I saw this woman before. She was in the crowd outside the town hall. The one who rushed up to the mayor and begged him to do something as we were leaving. Yeah, you are right. But unfortunately, that does not explain why she was trying to climb into the hospital. I know. Dr. Fisher, yeah? have you any idea what was in the hypodermic syringe she was carrying in her purse? Uh, no. I see. You have this woman's address? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right here. Okay, might be a good idea to take a look around her house, Straubinger, see if we can find anything there that'll throw some light on the deal. <laughs> Dr. Fisher goes back into the hospital, and I wait a few minutes while Straubinger attends to the removal of the body, and then he and I head for the dead woman's house. It's after dark when we pull up in front and get out of the car... Yeah, Mitchell, we seem to be getting nowhere in this investigation. And meanwhile, more people are being stricken each other. Yeah, I'd sure like to know why Fraulein Huntsman was trying to climb into the hospital. Perhaps merely to pay a secret visit to her husband. As you know, visiting is forbidden. Yeah, but that doesn't explain the hypodermic needle. I wonder if she fell while she was on her way to her husband's room, or had she already gotten to him and fell on her way out again? 
Unfortunately, there's no way of finding that out. Her husband has been in a coma for two days now. Uh, here we are. Perhaps there will be something here in their house to give us a clue. After you, Herr Metro. Thanks. Light switch ought to be around here somewhere. Well, perhaps on this one. Stravenger. Huh? Let a metal through that open window. Get down. Hey, you okay? Yeah, those shots. They came from the alley. Yeah, come on. Listen. Somebody running down the alley. Come on, after him. Could you see who it was? No. Lucky thing we didn't get those lights on. We'd have been dead ducks. He is out of sight. Maybe he ducked around in front of the house. As soon as we get out of the alley, we... There. Hey. Somebody standing in front of the house. Okay, just hold it right where you are. Dr. Fisher. Your doctor. But of course. Is something the matter? Slightly. Just a small matter of Starbinger and I getting shot at a few seconds ago. So I did hear shots after all. So did we, the hard way. So we chased the guy around the corner and run right into you. What are you doing here, Fisher? Why, I, I was looking for the two of you. To tell you that Frau Huntsman's husband has just died. What? Yeah. But why, why are the two of you looking at me so strangely? Surely you do not think I am the one who fired those shots at you? Gentlemen, if, if I were the one, would I be standing here now? That's a good question, Dr. Fisher. Let it go for now. And thanks for the information. Yeah. Come on, Strobinger. I, I will see you later, Dr. You can count on that. What do you think, Metro? About Fisher? Yeah. I don't know. Right now I'm so confused that anybody could be mixed up in the deal, including you and me. I do not think this is the proper time to make jokes about it, Herr Mitchell. Believe me, I'm not. Nothing in this deal fits together, including Frau Huntsman's husband's death. Did she kill him with a shot of whatever was in that syringe? But why would she do that? Why would anyone take a shot at us just now? Uh, questions, but no answers. Yeah. Well, come on. Let's go check with the mayor and find out if he and the others are having any better luck than we are. Oh, at last, Emma. Oh. Well, Elsa. Hello, Steve. I thought it was Mayor Gerhardt. Herr Mayor, is he not here, Fräulein Tanner? No. And to tell the truth, I'm worried about him. May I ask what you are doing here in his house? Well, I came here to tell him. Hey, look. The desk drawers are open and stuff scattered all around on the floor. What goes? As I started to knock, I noticed the door was ajar. I pushed it open. Then I saw that the door was in disorder and that large window over there was open. But there was no sign of Major Gerhardt. I see. I had better call my office and report this. Do you think anything could have happened to the Major, Steve? Hello? I don't know. Robbing us speaking. Why I'm did Major Gerhardt? You say you he came here, here to see Major Gerhardt? To about... tell him I could see no purpose to my remaining here any longer. Oh. Are you sure hmm. of that? Huh? Very well. Herr Mitchell, hmm. a word with you, if you please. Oh, sure. Excuse me, Elsa. Certainly. What is this, Strobinger? Any word about the mayor? No. I have just received information about Fräulein Tanner. Oh. Well, it doesn't surprise me. Right now, she's looking pretty guilty of something. No, right now, she is looking very innocent of everything. What do you mean? My men have completed a thorough investigation of her. Her reputation is of the highest. And we have just received word from Berlin on that sample of dye. Her analysis was completely correct. Mm. Well, I guess that smoke theory mine just went up and same. Yeah, my men had received no report concerning the mayor. Mm. I wonder if there was a fight here, or if somebody broke in looking for something. Elsa? Yeah? You say this window was open when you came in, huh? Yeah, I got to. Opens out into the garden. I... Mm -hmm. Say, Elsa, have you been out of this room since you arrived? Uh, why, no, Steve. Herr Mitchell, if Mayor Gerhardt has been kidnapped... Kidnapped? But I assure you, I have not... Hey, Mayor Gerhardt. Yeah, is something the matter? We were sure beginning to think so. Oh, I do not understand. We found your room here in disorder with no sign of you, Herr Mayor. We thought somebody has broken in. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> well, someone indeed did break in, gentlemen. It was myself. What's that? Yes. I needed some papers for my study here for a meeting. I came back to the house and I realized I'd locked myself out, so I... You mean it was you who climbed through this window here? Yeah, yeah. I got the papers I needed and went to the meeting. I see. Well, Mitchell, I guess that is that. Yeah, it sure is. Come on, Straubinger, let's go. Well, 
We go outside. Elsa drives off in her car, and Strominger starts for his. But I suddenly pull him into the garden besides the mayor's house. But, Mitchell, what is the matter? Come on, Strominger, and keep it quiet. But, but where to? We'll work our way up to that window. What is this all about? A lot of things just fell into place a moment ago, Strominger. There, here we are. We can see in from here. Yeah. Strange. Her mare is crouching against the door. Probably listening to make sure we've gone. See, now he's crossing the room. Taking something out of that cabinet. A hypodermic syringe. He's crossing to the fireplace. Come on, quick, through the window. Okay, Mayor Gerhardt, just hold it. Huh? You Let's I... have that hypodermic needle. <laughs> What's the meaning of this? Look, quit stalling. That syringe you've got in your hand is responsible for this epidemic. Mitchell, do you realize what you are saying? Sure, he was just about to destroy it in the fireplace. <laughs> Mitchell, have you gone mad? I was merely about to sterilize the needle in the flame before injecting myself. What? Yes, this is my weekly iron shot, which has been prescribed for me. I administer them to myself. Yeah, Mitchell, and for this you drag me in here. I apologize, Herr Mayor. Just a minute. Okay, if that is your iron shot, let's see you stick yourself with it. Oh, very well. There. Now, are you quite satisfied? I'll be... I can understand your overwrought nerves and your consequent wild imaginings, Herr Mitchell. And I'm willing to overlook it. And as for you, Staubinger... Although your attitude has hardly been one of the loyalty which a mayor deserves from his chief of police... Uh, my... I... my humble apologies, Herr Mayor. Now, if you will both be good enough to leave my house, Just why... Just a minute. Herr Mitchell. I get it now. No, we're not leaving, Mayor. Herr Mitchell, I warn you. Don't you get it, Straubinger? He's injected the virus into himself, and now he wants us to clear out so he can give himself the antidote. No. That's a lie. Now, get out at once. Herr Mitchell. Get your hands off me. I'm not getting out of here. Indeed you are. He has a gun. He had a gun. Now, we'll just make ourselves comfortable and wait, Gerhardt. No. No, please. Why not? We've got a lot of time, haven't we? Time to kill. Oh, no, just stay where you are. In that cabinet. A black bottle. I must have it. The antidote. Yes, the antidote. I'll get it. Mitchell, you were right. Yeah, you see, just before the mayor walked in, I spotted footprints in the ground outside his window, but they were woman's footprints. Elsa told me she hadn't left the room, so when the mayor said he was the one who'd broken in, I knew he was lying. Please, Mitchell, there's not much time. Oh, I've got plenty of time, Gerhardt. But then, who did break in here, and why? Who's the only other woman involved in this deal, Straubinger? Why, the dead one, Frau Huntsmann. Whose husband was sick in the hospital, Yeah. As soon as I realized it must have been her, I remembered something that just made sense. What do you mean? Right after I arrived here, she ran up to the mayor and begged him to do something for her husband. There were two doctors standing beside him, but she wanted him to save her husband. She knew that he had the antidote. Yeah. That's what she broke in here to steal. She got some of it, and she was climbing into the hospital to give it to her husband when she fell. Now, Mitchell, I beg of you the antidote. I must inject some immediately. Then it is the mayor who was responsible for the entire epidemic. Sure, we were so busy looking for mysterious means of transmission that we overlooked the obvious one. Six people came down with the disease at once, remember? They were the mayor's stooges. He injects them with a virus, they go out and spread it around, and then he gives them the antidote. Please, it was to be regarded as an experiment. Oh, a fine little experiment. I was told that it was merely a disabling disease, not fatal. It was desired to see what the results would be. Kind of backfired on you when Huntsman died, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'd tell you anything that you want to know, but please, you must let me have... Okay, Mayor, as soon as I'm sure there's enough of this stuff for all those people you've put in the hospital... Sure, yes, there's enough, I swear. Okay, then you got nothing to worry about. We want you to stay alive, too, you know. Uh, what do you mean? Well, after all, you can't try a dead man for murder. Murder? Yeah. You were pretty handy with that needle, Gerhardt, but the way it turned out... All you did with it was sew your own shroud. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jandot, with music by Robert Armbruster, is produced and directed by Bill Carn. 
Join us again next week at this time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. Enjoy the very best in radio. Be sure that you dial and write. Seems like you ought to hear Monty Woolley every Saturday night. The magnificent Montague. Every Saturday night, NBC. Welcome back. The police chief's observation that the woman asked the mayor for help when there were doctors who were standing right by the mayor was a logical one, but people are not often logical when it comes to what they expect of political leaders, often blaming or crediting them with everything that happens, good or bad, and turning to them to provide help in time of crisis, even if there are others who really are going to be providing the help or capable of delivering the help, which is why they only realized what was actually going on after the fact. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we have some comments uh, in particular around Tales of the Texas Rangers. And since we don't have a Tales of the Texas Rangers episode to read them on, we'll just read them here. And the same if we get any further ones. I won't tend to wait for any specific day. But we start with an email from uh, Jonathan who writes, Hello, Adam. At the beginning of this series... I couldn't really get into it, but after a while, I couldn't miss an episode. Now I really will miss the show. It appeared that in the beginning there were more executions, and at the end of the run, uh, all uh, confessors with mostly life imprisonments. Was this due to audience feedback? That's a good question, Jonathan, and I don't have an answer. I don't think so, though. I I think that there may have been a couple of things at work here, because I think season one and season two of Tales of the Texas Rangers are different. It's not an entirely different show, but there's a real difference in the type of cases that are covered and some of the stylistic things. Part of this might be an attempt to take the show in a direction that was a little bit more similar to Dragnet. The first season really focused almost exclusively on hard-hitting crimes of violence. The second season, much like Dragnet showed all the different sorts of cases the police might take on, you saw a greater variety of cases. As the Rangers investigated things like armed robberies without fatality and cattle rustling, You also saw more cases where Jace Pearson was partnered up with Clay Morgan, and that also is a little bit more like Dragnet, you know, without becoming this exact photocopy. Another factor may be the cases supplied by the Texas Rangers themselves. Oftentimes, a law enforcement department would have some sort of classic cases that they could offer to be adapted. And we'll hear that on Dragnet. When you listen to the first season, many of those cases are quite recognizable. Like, I remember the first time I went through Dragnet, I received emails from listeners who recognized details about the cases that the episodes were based on. One was such a classic that it had actually been told in an episode of Calling All Cars more than a decade before it was done on Dragnet. But those sort of emails stopped after the first year because you quickly run through all of the classic cases and you've got to dig through the files. Or you have to have policemen, as Jack Webb did, sell their stories 
for them to be made into Dragnet episodes. And for a case to be adapted to radio, it really does need to be interesting. It needs to be a case that was solved, usually, and one that's suitable for adaptation. There were actually some crime stories that came to Dragnet that were determined to be too lurid uh, to be adapted to air. And Jack Webb wrote about them in a book. But those sort of limitations would be on Tales of the Texas Rangers, so they needed to find more suitable stories once they'd gotten past the sort of classic Texas Rangers stories from the first season. And in particular, they were staying in modern times. It wouldn't be until the TV version that they would have Jace Pearson and Clay Morgan flitting about from modern times to the Old West, whichever era the story happened to come from. Of course, it's possible that there could have been some listener or network pressure, but I don't have any information to that effect. But thanks so much for the question, Jonathan. Over on Facebook, Eric writes, Excellent show. Sorry to see it go. And then on YouTube, The Butcher writes, Philo Vance retrieves stolen shoes. Johnny Dollar finds stolen jewelry. Steve Mitchell recovers stolen documents. Jace Pearson brings us death. Lots and lots of death. Thanks for the comment. It does have to be said that the bringer of death would be a great line to have on your resume. For what position, I'm not sure. And then Manias writes, I'm going to miss the Texas Rangers, but I'm looking forward to future series for Saturday Ahead. Keep up the awesome work, Adam. Well, thank you so much. And finally, Richard writes, Thank you, Adam, for faithfully providing uploads of old-time radio shows, and I especially enjoy your commentary. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Richard. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Stephanie, Patreon supporter since March of 2020, currently supporting the program at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Stephanie. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate or review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Dangerous Assignment, but join us back here tomorrow for Follow Vance, where... You've seen everything you wanted to in the morgue, haven't we, Vance? Yes, I suppose so, Markham. Let's get out of here. All right. You've examined the body and the man's clothes, Vance. What do you make of the situation? I'm not sure yet. I believe the man was killed by somebody who thought we could never identify his victim, though. In other words, the suit, the shoes, the tie, and the shirt were purchased so that the original clothes belonging to the dead man could be destroyed. And identification by that means made impossible. Now, what about the socks, Vance? Could be the murderer forgot to buy new socks and that the ones the victim was wearing were his own. Well, that's fine. That gives us a lot to go on. It gives us a great deal. Mm-hmm. For instance, I'll tell you this. The dead man habitually wore tweeds, scotch grain shoes, woolen ties. And I think I know where to pick up his trail. Vance, you're making all of this up. Nobody has been reported missing in this town that even remotely resembles the individual you described. I think the murderer knew nobody would report his victim missing. Here we go again. Certainly looks that way, doesn't it? Let me understand something. Yes? You built the clothes the dead man wore, the tweeds, the woolen tie, merely from the fact that he wore woolen socks. Now, let me point out that... But I didn't mark them. You didn't? No. Did you notice the tie clasp that was on the blue silk tie he was wearing? Yes. And except for the fact that it was about to slip off the tie, I noticed nothing unusual about it. It's an ordinary clip. Could be bought in any of a thousand stores. But it was about to slip off the silk tie. Now, what does that mean? That the victim almost lost his tie clasp. How do I know what it means? I think it means that the dead man usually wore woolen ties. They spread the clasp. Consequently, it couldn't hold a silk tie securely. Oh, 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 I see. I'll grant you a combination of woolen tie and woolen socks would mean tweeds and possibly scotch grain shoes, but what's your clue to his identity? Did you look on the inside of the socks, Markham? No. I did. And I found something on the inside of the socks 
that will take me directly to the inside of this case. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.